If we were to have a microphone and pass it around, I'm sure that everybody would be saying something different um, as to what aspect of church we most appreciate. What I want to do today is just share from my perspective, which I was asked to do, I was told. Tell it from your perspective, what you think. Uh, but I, I've thought a lot about church over the years, as I'm sure many of you here have too. The first church I remember being a part of was as a child. My parents took me to church. The church was a very quiet place. Literally, pin drop silence, except when one of the gentlemen would stand up and would pray or would read something or would say something or would announce a hymn. Those were the four things you were allowed to do. And the rest of the time, it was so quiet, you could hear the rumblings of people's stomachs. <laughs> Especially at the end of the hour, it got closer to lunchtime. But there I learned to sit still, because you had to. And uh, there was one gentleman, Mr. Martin was his name, no relation to the Martins here. Uh, he was a wonderful gentleman. He never stood up, he never prayed, he never did anything. But before he came to church, he would fill his pockets with sweets. <laughs> and at the end of the service, if you were a child who sat still, you got a sweet. And that's where I learned to sit still. A bit later, my parents moved to an Anglican church and we had that experience. Um, in my 20s, I came here to Tunbridge Baptist Church uh, to do a placement. And um, Joan and I met here just around there, because that was the front of the church, but it was around there. She came to invite me to the Girls' Brigade display which was like one of the major events in the church calendar. And I looked at her and I thought, yes, I'll come. <laughs> and I did. And then I went to see her afterwards for a debrief. And a few more things as well. We were actually married, not long, uh, about 18 months after that, literally standing in the same place we first met. And uh, we went off to India. And I'd had... The Brethren experience, I'd had the Anglican experience, I'd had the Baptist experience. And then we went to a church which was at the top of a mountain. We lived in the Himalaya Mountains, six and a half thousand feet. The church was a thousand feet walk up to get to. Everybody was happy when they walked into church, having walked up the mountain. And that church was unusual in that it had been built by the British for the British who used to go up there in the summer when it was too hot on the plains. And they even had in the pews a place where you could keep your rifle. And then we went to Mumbai and we went to a church in the, on the edge of the red light area. And it was a dilapidated building. The church didn't own it, it just rented it. It was hot most of the time. And it was not a large building, probably uh, 60 to 80 people most weeks, sometimes up to 100. There was one toilet. And the toilet was at the front of the church. It was literally behind where the person who was speaking would stand. And so you would see this queue after about an hour and a half of people just coming up towards um, to use the fac facilities. But that church was an amazing church and I learned so much from it. So I want to suggest <clears throat> that the core heart for me personally around church, and it's been mentioned in the, that little clip we had, is church as a 
flourishing community. And the evidence for that is manifold, but we don't have time to look at manifold. If you looked at the Old Testament, you'd see that that's what Israel was supposed to be, a flourishing community. We're not going to look at the Old Testament. But if you look at Jesus and his disciples, who really were the first church, we always talk about the early church being from Acts, you know, when it's born in Acts 2, etc., etc., which it is. But the early church was full of the people who were with Jesus. I mean, all the leaders of the early church, before Paul came along, were the disciples who had been with Jesus. How did they set up the church? What was the nature of the church? Well, it was everything that they had experienced being with Jesus. And the disciples were a flourishing community. They were bonded together. I mean, can you imagine being on that boat, going across the lake, Jesus asleep, and the wind and the waves were so big that even the fishermen were afraid. I mean, can you imagine the sense of camaraderie and connection and belonging which was engendered from experiences like that. And it wasn't just the disciples on the boat. It was all the other experiences where those disciples were bonded together. They had a sense of camaraderie and a sense of connection, a sense of friendship, a sense of love. As Jesus said, you'll know my disciples by their love for one another. And in the Bible, we all know that little instant, don't we, where one of the mothers intervenes and gets involved, and there's a big argument, there's a dispute. You all know about that? Yeah? The interesting thing is that it's the only one mentioned. In three years of the disciples being with Jesus, they have one argument. Well, we don't know that, because there's lots of things not in Scripture. But you'd think if there were big arguments, you'd think that they might appear in the record as well. They seem to get on well together. And not only that, can we have the next slide please? Not only would they have l strong, trust-filled, supportive relationships, but they also were disciples who were involved. They weren't just followers. They weren't just following Jesus as he went. They were doing stuff as well. In Luke 9 and Luke 10, we have the experience of Jesus sending out the 12 and then sending out the 72 to go ahead of him to every town or village he was going to go to prepare the way. And what were they to do? Everything that Jesus did. To heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach. That's what the disciples were to do. And the very interesting thing about it is if you read Luke 9 and Luke 10, you discover that Jesus sent them out at a time when the disciples were completely and utterly theologically unsound. They were. When Jesus said to them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be handed over and I'm going to die, do you know what they said? No, 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 no. That's not going to happen to you. They were completely theologically unsound and yet Jesus still sent them out. So the disciples had this strong sense of belonging and they had a contribution which they were making. And we find that in the early church. If we were to read Acts chapter 4, it says this in verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. That's not what's up there. Just uh, I'm coming to that. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one considered any, any of his possessions his own, but they freely shared what they had. There was this sense of belonging, of being together. And of course, the church wasn't like in buildings like this. It was in people's houses. And hospitality is mentioned as one of the gifts which people need. Why? Because when you go to someone's house, someone takes care of you. Someone cooks a meal. Someone looks after you. And that was the experience. The church was in the homes of disciples. And it's that place 
that sense of connection with other people. And of course, also, they were people who made a contribution. We who are many form one body, and each member belongs to the others, Paul wrote. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. In proportion to the gift, is some, if it is prophesied, I can't read that, it's too small. <laughs> and I made that PowerPoint, nobody else, so blame me, all right. If we have different gifts according to the grace given to us, if a person's gift is prophesying, let them use it in proportion to their faith. Now look at the different things mentioned. Inter interesting, the different things mentioned. Prophesying, let them use it in proportion to their faith. If it is serving, let them serve. If it is teaching, let them teach. If it's encouraging, let them encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let them give generously. If it's in leadership, let them govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let them do it cheerfully. These weren't just gifts which a few could use. These are normal things. Serving, giving, having mercy, alongside teaching and preaching all, 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 the, all the others. These are gifts you need in a community, and everyone was to play their part. So we have this picture of the disciples, strong relationships, trust-filled, belonging, making a contribution, and then we have the early church with the same. One of the key things is that, uh, can we have the next slide? A flourishing Seeing community is not just people who all are the same. It's actually modeling what it means to overcome difference, to break down barriers. This picture is a picture of the Azusa Street Revival in 1906. It's a place in Los Angeles. When we lived in America for a year, I went there. And Azusa Street was the watershed time for the modern Pentecostal and charismatic movement. And it, it was probably the most known revival that has ever occurred uh, since the days of the Book of Acts. And the key driver behind this, although he wouldn't say he was a driver, but the person God used in this was someone called William Seymour black man in America in 1906. And William Seymour says this, he says, the sign that God was with us had nothing to do with the fact that people spoke in tongues, that people experienced healing, that different things happened that happen, hadn't happened in America or anywhere else for a long period of time. He said that wasn't the sign of that God was with us. It wasn't the major sign. He said the major sign was that black and white stood shoulder to shoulder as they worshipped God. Barriers broken down between black and white. And we see that in the disciples. You know, even in Jesus choosing his disciples, he chose people who were different from each other. We had a tax collector, we had a fisherman, we had a zealot. They're like, you wouldn't put those three together, would you? They're all different. And then those disciples with Jesus spend their time breaking down barriers. Next, uh, next slide, please. Now, this is in Luke 7, but it's just one of... Lots of different examples of Jesus and his disciples breaking down barriers. In this case, it is Simon the Pharisee and a woman who arrives, who's completely different. Breaking down between rich and poor, between elite and those at the bottom of the period, between those who have lots of experience and opportunity and those who have very little. Breaking the barriers down. We see that with Jesus and the disciples, and hey, what do we see in the church? Barriers broken down. The biggest of which, of course, was between Jew and Gentile. We see in Acts 10, Acts 10, you know, that experience of Peter being called by Cornelius, going to his house, and out of that, Peter realizes, wow, 
This is amazing. The good news of the kingdom of God is not just for the Jewish people. Everybody is welcome. Of course, Jesus had modeled that in his walking through Samaria and lots of other things that other rabbis wouldn't do. But Peter and the other disciples finally got it. They finally realized that we aren't to create barriers. We are to break them down between people. And so Paul would write, um, ne next slide, to the Romans. He says, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. All the barriers that prevent people from belonging, from pre prevent people from having those strong, trust-filled relationships are to be broken down in the church. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. It's difficult, but it's amazing. You know, it's really important that we are a church of difference. Not a church that's homogeneous, who all look the same, think the same, get on the same. We can even have different theology. And when we embrace people with different understanding and different experience and different theology and different ways of seeing things, we will be stronger because we will be that model that God always intended for the church to be. All the things that prevent people from being together, that divide us, Race, sexuality, gender, age, economic status, theology. All those things need to be broken down. For we are one in Christ. It's what Jesus demonstrated. It's what Paul said. Finally, a flourishing community is not one that is just inward looking. It's not just about ourselves. A flourishing community is outward looking taking the good news of this new era, God's new era. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's, it's God announcing like a way to live, which God always intended, which it was about life and its fullness. It was about flourishing. It was about shalom, wholeness, completeness, and all, all the rest. And Jesus and his disciples, of course, demonstrated that in the way that they lived and Jesus said, as he stood in the synagogue in Nazareth, he quoted Isaiah, which was his self-understanding of what he as the Messiah was to be, to let prisoners free, to release the oppressed, to preach the good news, to preach about God's agenda that everybody flourishes, that everyone can have opportunity, that it's not just for some, it's for all, that as we center our lives around Jesus, everyone can belong. And then we see that in the church. The interesting thing about the word church is, in the Greek, it is ecclesia. That's the term for church. We don't know the term that Jesus used because he spoke in Aramaic. But the translations have translated that term into ecclesia. And at the time, one of the uses of the term ecclesia was that it was used of a community council. Now, when I was a child, I was taught that the term ecclesia, um, the term, well, I wasn't told ecclesia then, but when I was a child, I was told the word church meant the set apart ones. So it's like you all come apart. You're apart, you're apart, you're apart. You're different. You're holy. Don't get involved, you know, in all of that stuff. You're... But actually, the word ecclesia means those who a community council, that was the term used, it was used for a community council. Those who came apart in order to plan blessing on their community. Isn't that a fantastic like, definition of what we should be? A group of people who, who when we come apart, when we come together, a part of our agenda is how can we bring the good news of this new era of the kingdom of God where everybody can flourish to the world around us? That's our task. 
So what I've done, just finally, I'm not sure whether Neil allowed me to do this because he told me I've got to speak what, but this is, this is, uh, next one please. This is my definition of church. A vibrant, flourishing community centered around Jesus and his way. Of course, you know the disciples were called the way, the way of Jesus before they were called church, where all divisions are broken down. And the good news of God's new era of life, the reign of God, the kingdom of God in its fullness is extended to the world. Let's just pause and, and just reflect for a minute. Maybe close your eyes as the, uh, the band come up to lead us. Think about church, TBC. How we can continue to be a community that flourishes. A community where barriers are broken down. A community where we experience those strong, trust-filled relationships. A community where everyone can make a contribution, a community that is focused outward, that seeks to take the experience of fullness of life that we know out into the world.